Recently, a viral clip of Overwatch 2 dropping from 600 FPS to around 250 FPS was used to criticize the game's optimization. I was very disgusted with the venomous ridicule the original poster had received from several replies, as most of them completely missed the point. I truly wondered, would these people recognize how poor the optimization would have to be if the video showed a 10 FPS drop from a 70 FPS scenario, or a 3 FPS drop from a 35 FPS scenario? The answer is nobody would care, even though all of these are equally unoptimized. People need to stop being so obsessed with the base scenario performance, which is mostly just an expression of the hardware and resolution. Any drop in FPS is just the addition of extra milliseconds worth of processing. A common statement I'm trying to rid from our culture is that studios develop with random FPS numbers in mind. Outside of physics, studios develop with their target systems in mind. There are thousands of system configurations that would result in different FPS. So how again would studios target a arbitrary FPS number? Include the target specs and internal resolution if you want to discuss FPS targets properly. Why? Because if someone saw the last scenario's FPS, most people would bash the online post with upgrade recommendations. Better hardware or a lower resolution will reduce the effect of millisecond timing, providing better performance. But the effects ratio cost will synchronize with how much the base scenario cost increases or decreases with the system specs. This is why hardware upgrade suggestions are irrelevant to the discussion of actual optimization. We still don't understand if that effect, regardless of the system specs, is relatively optimized. How we can determine this is by referencing the original scenario setup and finding the percentage of how much that setup performs on our measurable hardware. Now why is it so important that we have a good estimate cost on a 3060 at 1080p? Because thanks to this channel, it is the most measured hardware. We can show right off the bat this Overwatch 2 effect is costing as much or even more than some of the most advanced and time-consuming pipeline processes we've measured in rendering. So instinctively, you should know already something is very wrong. Then, there's the direct scenario and effect budget comparison. Now to call the effects in these games optimized because they're faster is still terribly wrong, because that acts as a justifier for hideous graphic approaches. These effects are more optimized because they are faster and provide objectively better looking effects. But what actually makes an effect optimized? Well if you hadn't noticed, all of these titles scale to different generations of console hardware, and in this video we're going to measure the point of reference. We're going to measure a slew of effects inside the Phantom Pain so that anyone can incriminate poorly optimized scenarios just by looking at them, and so that anyone can aggressively confront ignorant fake experts that try to label incompetence as miracles. The first effect we're going to measure is volumetric clouds. We decided to capture this when the in-game weather condition was officially set to cloudy, but the in-game setting for volumetric clouds is also enabled. The protagonist will be forward rendered with an invisibility effect so we can measure the full screen cost. The sky is rendered with a single triangle, pre-calculated atlases, and uses a Bayer matrix for color debanding. The weather condition clouds are rendered with a dome mesh and pre-calculated cloud contents. We'll go ahead and alter the viewing mode so that the draw influences are more visible. The performance setting specified cloud effect is also rendered with a dome mesh and Bayer matrix. The effect uses a high frequency and low frequency mask and takes almost a full millisecond. Now we have some referenceable timings, and a game that we could quickly compare this to is CryEngine's KCD2, which has some pretty impressive cloud rendering. Unlike Phantom Pain's clouds, these clouds utilize temporal rendering, but separately from poor anti-aliasing methods. Other than a few temporal instabilities, it actually remains impressively coherent even under harsh and complex disocclusion. Here is the full screen capture. As shown in our dedicated analysis, a compute cheater updates a 3D texture set for clouds. This action is a good example of what kind of operation will not scale with resolution. The 3D texture is used in a shadow mask projection draw. Finding an output in this draw is a bit odd as no visible geometry is visible on screen. The sky is rendered much faster after lighting is resolved. Then 3 quarter res render targets have noisy cloud outputs rendered to them, along with a depth downscale. The result is quickly denoised temporally, and blended on top of the sky. Now we have some interesting timing comparisons, which will probably be explored in another video since there's a lot more effects we need to measure first. The next category of effects relate to rain, from the camera lens drops to the satisfying lightning in the distance. Here is the final frame, 
And as you can see, lighting consists of simple BC3 masks and quads. Most effects, including these, just use the fog atlas and depth buffer. The rain droplets are a little more complex. A sprite sheet is used for the droplet character collisions. While not a full screen effect, the character is drawn pretty fast with that transparent invisibility effect. The camera lens droplets use a downsampled version of the scene with instance quads outlining the droplet shape derived from a small BC3 mask. But we're not done with rain effects yet, as we want to show a few more details about how interior wetness exclusion works and measure these loose droplet effects that appear when slow motion gameplay is triggered. As a fun fact, a similar effect is present in the Death Stranding titles. When the in-game weather condition is set to rain, after the decal pass, the albedo and roughness specular g-buffers are duplicated so that their information can be used in a wetness projection pass. While output invocations are present in the albedo buffer, all the test scenes showed no change. The only detectable changes exist in the second render target output, and only in the red channel which holds the roughness information. A 512 squared BGRA8 storing interior depth info is cross-referenced with the scene depth to determine where lower roughness should be applied by the rain. If you watched our first video on Fox Engine, you'll notice that the QMAP Atlas is no longer used in the main directional Sun-Moon Lighting Pass, so the specular buffer has barely any effect shown inside of it. A dedicated reflection QMAP is used alongside all the main base pass lighting inputs during the tone mapping stage. Here, that interior map is used again to block where that reflection cube map should be applied. As for all the elaborate particles in the air, all of these are drawn with small quads. While most of them use the low-res BC3, depth, and fog combo, transparent liquids like the rain use the additional pre-FX scene copy, cube map, and normal map BC3 combo. After color grading is processed, the image is copied to be used in a vignetting and chromatic aberration process. Phantom Pain was the game that we referenced in our first analysis when discussing how camera effects should be used in a purposeful manner. The next effect we need to measure is the water, which may not look impressive when high effects are enabled, but when very high effects are enabled, a much more satisfying result is provided, and it quickly becomes very impressive when movement and dynamic ripples are introduced. We'll need to measure the effect when the ripples are created, and we'll use the invisibility effect to measure the full screen cost. This is the frame with very high settings enabled for the effect. The ripple shape is derived from a BC3 and projected on a small render target area with several overlapping quads. This means a high amount of overdraw is isolated in a small area. The main render target is cleared after the ripples are saved in a much smaller buffer. The river mesh is quite simple, meaning quad overdraw won't affect performance too much. This effect is highly texture and pixel shading bound. The collision splash effects just use a sprite sheet. When effects are set below very high, water and the related splash effects are shaded on a half resolution buffer and then upscaled using the depth buffer. The ripple effect cost only scales with how many ripples are within screen space view. A particular scene in the game has a huge amount of dynamic candles, and this was processed pretty fast despite the heavy visual impact. A major effect in this game are smoke effects, and they tend to look pretty good for a PS3 scalable effect. The effect takes long to process because it's several overlapping animated triangles creating tons of pixel shader invocations and overdraw. Pretty much all smoke effects in the game use sprite sheets. There's a scene in the beginning that uses tons of these sprite effects, but less than 50% of a desktop 3060 can produce 60 frames per second at 1080p. This particular shot is able to produce these effects in almost a single millisecond using sprite sheets and emissive decals rendered post-tone mapping. The dense smoke above still maintains a millisecond cost in a full screen scenario. The next important effect we need to measure are blood decals, which have their shader modified to output green for monetization purposes. These are rendered after lighting is resolved which is far better than the typical dithered mess that UE games like Silent Hill 2 and Callisto Protocol provide via debuffer decals. These horribly dithered messes are not graphical progression, but instead a prime example of graphics getting worse while depending on incompetent smearing anti-aliasing. The final result isn't even noiseless when the camera is still. In one of the beginning scenes, a planar reflection is used and computed in almost a single millisecond. 
The next effect we want to analyze are glass shards, which have a full screen appearance in a later cutscene. These are just quads instead of geometric glass pieces. The next effect we need to measure are the sun rays, which we could only find in this forest area. These are drawn with fairly simple meshes. The most expensive one is the closest, as it appears the most in screen space surface area. The last major category of effects we want to measure relate to the main boss fight, as many smoke effects, particle emitters, and blast effects need to be handled at the same time. At most, these effects will cost around 2 milliseconds. Most small flowing particles are done with small quads reducing the amount of surface area they shade. Elaborate effects like the railgun ray mostly use tight cutout geometry. Now we have all this context about what takes up performance inside an effect. Like most aspects in rendering, it's mostly related to how much surface area on the buffer is shaded, and how many inputs that effect is using. No effect in that Overwatch 2 clip is transparent like water or glass. There's no need for overlapping sprite sheet quads, and there's no effect that should be using anything more than a single BC3. There are plenty of elements that could have used tight geometry cutouts with simple animations and shaders. There's no volumetric or liquid simulations. Sprite sheets, if they did exist in the scene, should not be overlapping. The effect timings for Phantom Pain aren't even the fastest timings Fox Engine can provide. All of the effects were measured with a very high setting, but on low, a massive amount of performance can be saved through a very specific type of half-res shading. The half-res depth stencil used in earlier SSAO passes is overwritten with a different type of depth downscale, while an RG16 stores the different minimal and maximum depth discontinuities. Using the half-resolution depth stencil with greater equal testing, the RG16 is used alongside the usual graphic effect inputs, but two half-res render targets are written to simultaneously. Each one stores the effect shading with different depth continuities, and their alpha channels contain the composite strength. While 2023 titles like Dead Space Remake also shade effects at a half resolution, the 2023 Frostbite Pipeline does not go through the links Fox Engine makes to make sure depth edges have seamless upscaling. About two months ago, Threat Interactive published findings centering around major optimization issues in Dead Space Remake's rendering. But so many Dead Space community members ignored this discovery to call us depraved names and insults because they wanted to defend garbage they had purchased. These completely complacent brainwashed members defended the cost of a hologram design that takes just as long to process as Unreal's Lumen GI and Reflections combined. Meanwhile, an actually visible full hologram menu with overlapping info tabs and phantom pain is processed literally 10 times faster than in Dead Space because it doesn't rely on high resolution video processing. The data we provide is so important to incriminating incompetence, and we wouldn't be able to distribute so much information without our current Patreon members. As much as people complain in the comments about having to hear this, we have to see revenue growth from our efforts. And community support through Patreon is the best way to keep our work sustainable and spread the required culture that will support real progression and graphics. Consider helping us out by filling out this list with your name by the time we release our next video. Our videos are meant to be watched in order of release like a training course, and are designed to create a new consumer and developer that can pinpoint modern neglect. Subscribe to the channel to show that consumers and developers are waking up to new standards, and keep a lookout for our next video.